Jeremy Corbyn, the MP for Islington North, has just returned from Gaza on his 10th, 20th, 30th, who knows how many times he's been there over the last decades, tirelessly campaigning against this simple thing, injustice. Because, you know, being somebody, myself, being half Irish, I grew up being very aware of the problems in Northern Ireland. And when you see injustice, you know it will just breed hatred. It will just breed fuel to the fire. It will just breed more and more and more problems. And so it is that that we stand for, this simple concept that we want to see justice in Gaza and justice in Palestine. Uh, he was there, as I said, just up until last night with a parliamentary delegation who were there for Interpol, looking at the work that Interpol were doing. And I'm very pleased and very honoured to introduce him to you now, Jeremy Corbyn, MP. Good evening, everybody. Pleasure to be here and a real pleasure to follow and hear what Harry Freer had to say. And on behalf of an awful lot of people, unknown number all around the world, I want to say a big thank you to you, Harry, for the message that you sent out. And for the work that you do. And also, personally, a very big thank you to Interpol um, for its work over a very long period of time. I've got to know Ibrahim Hewitt, the chair, extremely well, and I consider him to be a very good friend. And I think he's done a fantastic job in leading and guiding Interpol, which has done such great practical work. And uh, I recognize that it is a charity working for the betterment of people who are very much up against it. And every penny, cent, dollar, euro, pound raised uh, goes towards helping people in really desperate need in Palestine. And so I hope that in all our work over the next months and years, we will ensure that Interpol is top of our list and does continue to provide this very, very vital help. What I want to do is just share a few experiences with you and then a couple of thoughts, if I may, at the end of the evening. As uh, has been explained, I've been involved in issues to do with Palestine for a very long time. And when I first became involved in Palestinian issues, when I was elected to Parliament for the first time in 1983, to even utter the word Palestine in the House of Commons invoked hissing, um, objections, what are you saying, what are you talking about, and gradually things changed. The strength even huge, and the attitude taken by a lot of members of Parliament has begun to change very, very quickly. And uh, I can point to lots of uh, uh, events during the tragic history of the Palestinian people that have changed things. But having been brought up on the idea that, um, uh, I'm not blaming my parents for this, I'm blaming the British education system, that um, my parents were very strongly in favour of Palestine, Palestine and Palestinian people. But being told at school that essentially there was an empty desert from which Israel was created in 1948 and that anyone who was trying to interfere with the development of the state of Israel was somehow or other an enemy and a terrorist without uh, being told the real history of the place the history of the Palestinian people, what happened in 1917, what with the uh, offers that were made secretly to many people, and the way in which the Palestinian people were driven out of their homes in the Nakba of 1948, and there they still live. And there's something traumatic, quite frankly, in visiting a refugee camp in uh, Syria or Lebanon or Jordan never mind the ones in Gaza, and meeting people who are third, almost fourth generation, who've never known anything than life in those refugee camps. And I think of the hopes and aspirations I have for my own sons, and all the opportunities that are there available for them, as they are for the children of everyone in this room, uh, in this country or in Europe. The right to travel, the right to work, the right to study, the right to dream, the right to inspire, the right to aspire. And yet, translate that back to a highly educated young person growing up in a refugee camp. What are their options? What are their opportunities? They can learn, they can study, they can discuss, they can debate, 
and they can be very well informed. But can they travel? Can they work? Can they develop their careers? Do they have that worldwide opportunity one for all our children? No, they don't. The crisis of the Palestinian people is not a crisis caused by the Palestinian people. It's a crisis caused by expulsion, by occupation, by imprisonment, and by encirclement in the case of Gaza. And we must always remember that all of this issue and this problem is created by human and human development and human decision making by various politicians. In visiting the hospitals in Gaza, we come across a number of things. One is the total dedication of the nursing and medical staff in those hospitals. Total, absolute dedication. I meet nurses and doctors in this country and I very strongly support and admire what they do. But they don't have to endure the idea that the electricity is going to be off for six hours every day. They don't have to endure the possibility that the ambulance may not get through. If they're on the West Bank, it might be held up at a checkpoint for hours and hours. They don't have to debate and negotiate for hours on end to send a critical patient to a specialist unit in another country. And why are there so many people suffering burns in Gaza? Yes, it's because of the bombardment and the war, but it's also because of the electricity shortages, which means that people light their homes with candles or kerosene lamps, and they, unfortunately, are very dangerous and cause fires. I spent time visiting the universities in Gaza, and the thing is that 55% of the adult population of Gaza, young adult population, are graduates from the university. 55%. Far higher than this country, and I think probably higher than anywhere in Europe. Possibly the highest anywhere in the world. And the unemployment rate is more than 60%. And so we have this super-educated, unemployed population. What a crying shame. What a waste. What a waste of education, what a waste of energy, what a waste of resources. Allow those people to work. Allow the economy to develop. That is what they want, that's what I want, that we all want here. But the standards in those universities are very, very high indeed. They are partnering with universities in this country and all over Europe and indeed all over the world. And Interpal's practical help has been able to finance some students so that they can get the fees paid, get the necessary equipment in order to achieve their qualifications and get through. And you will find those that have managed to get to other places beyond Palestine working in hospitals, universities, high-tech industry and businesses all over the Gulf and all over the Middle East. That is a real achievement that's been made possible by what we do here. The school, the schools, again, the teachers work incredibly hard, and the United Nations Relief and Works Agency has provided education for Palestinian children since 1948. The population is growing very fast. Many of the schools are in double shifts, where the first group of children come in at seven, finish in the middle of the day, and then another school takes over exactly the same building in the afternoon. Well, of course that's better than children not going to school. Of course it is. I fully understand that. But I think when a child goes to school, it's not just an education they get. It's a social interaction, it's a cohesion, it's a place, it's a home, it's somewhere they belong to. And their school, their building, is something very important to them. And so there's at least a hundred new schools needed in Gaza in the next ten years. And then there are the huge environmental issues. They have been talked about earlier today, so I won't go on about them at any great length. But simply to say this, there are 1.75 million people living in a very small place, the densely, most densely populated place on Earth, and the water supply system is absolutely chronic. The aquifers underneath Gaza are falling at the rate of two metres per year. That is, from this thing to here, every year the aquifer is falling. The same amount is actually falling in the Dead Sea at the present time. That is totally unsustainable. They're having to drill wells down, down 80 metres in order to get poor quality water from them. We saw a water treatment plant. The water treatment plant was impressive and was good and is something that should be encouraged and developed. But taking water out of an aquifer is not sustainable unless that aquifer is being replaced by rainwater. There isn't enough rainwater to replace it. Therefore, it's been filled 
with seawater that's seeping in, therefore it comes salty, or sewage that's seeping in because there's no proper sewage treatment plant, so it becomes dangerously polluted. Quite honestly, if that aquifer was under London, Paris, New York, or anywhere else, it would be closed immediately and all pumping would be banned, and all pumping should stop immediately from that aquifer. But it can't, because there's no alternative supply of water. So, what do we do? We have to harness what's there. There's gas off the coast of Gaza. There's gas off the coast of Gaza that could be used for, to power a desalination plant and generate electricity. That can't happen because the blockade will not allow the necessary equipment through for it. And so, there has to be imaginative things of conserving water, of processing water, and of using as little water possible on agriculture and all the things that are necessary. But these things, necessity brings about the mother of invention. And the most exciting thing to me was on the last day of our visit, we, uh, partly I think because I kept um, insisting on this, uh, that we looked at the agricultural projects. There's a massive achievement, and it really is the credit of everyone in Gaza, that the country, Gaza, that part of Palestine called Gaza, is now self-sustaining in fruit and vegetables. And everywhere you look, every small piece of land, there's vegetables growing, there's tomatoes growing, there's olive trees being planted, there is production going on. There is markets for those vegetables to be produced. But Interpal have now got hold of 50 acres of land that, I will say in one minute, 50 acres of land that is going to become another green revolution, another green oasis, more food for the people of Palestine. We need to get behind that project and support it. It's going to need equipment, it's going to need tools, it's going to need skills, and I hope we can build up some links with the universities in this country. It's going to be a really exciting project. And so, I want to say in conclusion, Interpal is raising money, Interpal is helping the people of Gaza in their most desperate and darkest hour. My job as a member of parliament is to use my position in parliament to speak up against the poverty of the Palestinian people, against the unemployment of the against the water shortages of the Palestinian people, against the imprisonment of so many people literally in jails, figuratively around the area of Gaza, or because of the lack of life chances, those tens of thousands that are living in the refugee camps. I've had the good fortune to visit many of those camps and meet Palestinian people in all parts and all parts of the world. In 1948, in 1948 they lost their homes for the most part and went to the refugee camps and to the four corners of the world. But the vote at the UN showed the power of Palestinian diaspora. Every Latin American country voted for Palestinian recognition. Mexico recognized Palestine many, many years ago, and more recently every other country in Latin America has followed suit. That is partly because of solidarity campaigns, but also because of the power of the Palestinian communities in all those places. Here we are in London, in Britain, one of the greatest cities on earth, with the most fantastically diverse population. Let's get to it in solidarity and support of the Palestinian people to do all we can to alleviate their suffering. And I will do all I can in Parliament to, I hope, articulate the views of so many others that the suffering of the Palestinian people must end. They must have their right to live the lives that we all want for our children, they all want for their children. That is the real road to peace. Thank you very much indeed.